The episode you're about to listen to is part of season two series on the body, how our bodies shape our experience and how they both inspire and enable us to create art. Welcome to another episode of Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. On this show, we meet artists transforming lives with their work. Do you ever spend time looking at yourself in the mirror? If you do, what do you feel? Frustration? Satisfaction? Love? Learning to be friends with that person we see in the mirror can be a lifelong journey. Hopefully, at one point in your life, you look in the bathroom mirror and say, yep, that is me. Our bathroom mirror isn't the only one we look into. What about all of the other mirrors around us, like the media? That's a mirror too. What do you feel looking in that mirror? Shame, ridiculed, fear, invisible. The eyes of others, those are mirrors too. Do they look just a little too long? Do they look away too quickly? What is wrong with this picture? You know you exist and you know that you're fabulous. It's these other mirrors that are wrong. What do you do? If you're filmmaker Julie Wyman, you decide to start creating new mirrors. Mirrors that will correct the warped, tired visions of the mirrors of the media and will reflect the diversity of bodies as they exist in the world. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Listen and let us inspire you. Julie Forrest Wyman is a filmmaker and performer whose work aims to challenge and expand our culture's narrow range of represented bodies. Her 2012 documentary, Strong, tells the story of top American weightlifter Cheryl Hayworth. While being a top performing athletic competitor, with a weight of over 300 pounds, Cheryl defies normal preconceptions of what a female athlete should look like. She also struggles with the reality that the world around her isn't always built for or accepting of someone her size. Julie's other films all deal with themes of difference, whether it's queerness or differences of body shapes and sizes. Her work is helping to expand which bodies are represented and how expanding our very narrow notions of bodies can more accurately reflect the society we live in. Her current work in progress, while still adhering to this goal, is taking Julie into some uncharted territory. As an adult, Julie was diagnosed with hypochondroplasia, a form of dwarfism. For most of her life, Julie was aware of differences in her body. Having this diagnosis provides her with both a way to make sense of this difference and the opportunity to connect with the community of others with dwarfism. It also presents her with the challenge to make a film that is deeply personal and highly collaborative with others in this community. Hi, Julie. Thank you so much for being on this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. Can you start by introducing yourself, telling us who you are and what you do? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. It's really great to have this opportunity to speak with you. I'm Julie Wyman, and I am a documentary filmmaker and a professor of filmmaking at UC Davis. I got into filmmaking because I have a body that is different than other people's. And I didn't really have any way to, I didn't know how to describe that for a really long time. How is it different? I have kind of shorter arms and shorter legs. So I lived all my life in a body that was kind of different and that shaped all my experience and it shaped how I saw the world and saw myself in relation to what was beautiful, what was powerful, who got to fit in and belong. 
And as I became an adult, I started getting terms like feminist terms and political terms and ways of understanding what it means to be different. And I started wanting to change the field of media that only gives us a very narrow range of bodies that get to be seen and get to be beautiful and get to be powerful and get to be interesting. And so I I started making films about people whose bodies don't fit in. That's kind of, I feel like the through line to my work that it wasn't even intentional. I knew I wanted to see fat bodies and queer bodies on the screen in ways I hadn't. But I also didn't quite realize until more recently that it was really that experience of not fitting in and how we navigate it that was what was driving me as both from a personal place and as like what the kinds of people and situations that I felt really passionate enough to <laughs> do the hard work of making a film and find out how to learn how to do that. Right. That is fascinating that you just said that it wasn't till recently that you realized that that was what was driving your work. How did that come about that this realization came to you? Right. Well, also, I should back up one step and say I, the reason I started talking about my body right away when you asked me to introduce myself is that when I said I'm a filmmaker, it felt really important to also say that. I'm a little person. I identify as a little person and a disabled person, but that's a really recent way that I've been describing myself. And it's a way of understanding myself that came a few years ago, um, but after a few year process of deciding two things. One, I, I knew I had personal stakes in this experience that I was interested in of not fitting physically, but I didn't know what to call myself. And so I was like, I have to make a film about that. I have to finally make a film about my body. I've never done that before. And then I also was having a lot of like pain. I was having a lot of joint pain with my hips and shoulder problems. And I, it was hard to diagnose or figure out how and if I could solve it. And one test came back and said I had genetic differences in my femurs, my femur heads. And that set me, both of those things set me on a journey of trying to find out, do I have a form of dwarfism? Because in my family, we had always talked about, oh, there might be partial dwarfism in our history because I have the same body as my dad and my aunt and my grandma. So I, I knew I inherited it. I knew where I got the body I had, but I didn't know what to call it. And I no one else seemed to really have it be a big part of their identity where I did. And, and I felt very alone with it. Hmm. And I wanted to have a sense of understanding, like, what is this? And am I part of something else? Am I part of something bigger? Are there more people out there like me? Right. And that kind of question launched me into both the film project I'm working on now and the very personal <laughs> quest of like what, what resulted in having a diagnosis and a test, a genetic test that came back saying, yes, you do have a genetic mutation that is, you know, in the category of hypochondroplasia, which is a form of dwarfism, which is a less common form than the most common form, which is a chondri- called a chondroplasia. Hmm. People with hypochondroplasia tend to be a little taller as little people, but the diagnostic height limit is 4'11", and I'm five feet. I'm like a super tall dwarf, (laughs) but I have that genetic mutation. And so my proportions are different than a lot of people, but it's in some ways a subtle difference and in other ways something that shaped a lot of my life. So, Hmm. So anyway, getting that diagnosis for me was really helpful and affirming in a way, because I was like, I knew it. Like I knew there was, you know, and they were like, and by the way, we want to tell you, you inherited it from your father. And I'm like, "Uh, yeah, I know that, you know, because my parents had to both get tested. So they were like, why are you testing my mom? This clearly is not from my mom, but they both got tested. And then the doctor, the geneticist, they ran a test, which just determined that. So, so anyway, that's why I found out like at age 49, (laughs) that I am a little person and and a tall little person at that. So I'm kind of still on the borderlands of, you know, what is considered little person and dwarfism, but it's become a big part of my life. 
Wow, that's an amazing story. And what I'm really just sitting with that we don't necessarily have to talk more about is that the diagnosis was a relief almost to you, or it was it was affirming, which I find to be a great thing to think about, really. I think because of my experience and also having various experiences at doc negative experiences with doctors mm. where doctors would be really and it, but were both doctors and medical charts were super judge you know super judgmental of like my yes. weight and the way my body shaped and just and even and like all kinds of circumstances but medical ones in particular where like the scale is a, is like an enemy really an enemy and like a thing that will make me feel bad for weeks if I stay Stand on it. Yeah. It is bizarre for me to hear myself say that that diagnosis was a relief too, because I'm really suspicious and skeptical about the power that medicine wields and how it comes from an outside perspective, looking down. I mean, literally looking down, but also like just with an assumption that it's best to fit the norm. Mm. And not necessarily with an assumption that it's best to have a world where everybody can fit and thrive and feel safe and connected and belong. So it still feels like charged and weird for me to say like, oh, medicine helped me in this way. But it did because I'm in such gray area about being a little bit little, like being not, not a little person, being a little person, but different than a lot of little people. It kind of was affirming because I think there's a real tendency, even in, in my family and my parents and other people I grew up with to just be, to say, oh no, you're just like everyone else. You're normal. So to not, to kind of not acknowledge that difference as a way of trying to reassure me that everything's okay. Right. As opposed to seeing me and seeing like, oh yeah, your arms are a little shorter and that's really cool. And here's why, you know, and just, right. just that simple distinction is so important. So like, there's a way in which I always wondered, is this real or is it not real? And so finding something in my genes, in my DNA that could be found felt like, okay, this is, I didn't just make this up. Well, it's sort of perfect that you also work in film and media, because I think if there are two things in our society that are excluding and also, I don't even know what the other word is, but it's medicine, Western medicine, which is sort of based on probably most of the time a typical white male and media which especially if we're talking about what kind of bodies are shown, the frame is very narrow. So it just makes so much sense that we would be talking about your work as a filmmaker and then your experience with Western medicine or the way that you've been, your negative experiences there. I really want to talk about this new film you're working on. The last time I read it was untitled. Is it still untitled? It's still untitled. It's still living under the temporary title, the working title of Untitled Dwarfism Project. Okay. Well, you said so many things about it that intrigued me, especially as a fellow documentary filmmaker. It sounds like it's going to be a bit of a hybrid film and that it incorporates both elements of what we think of as traditional documentary, but then performance elements. Can you talk about what kind of performance do you mean when you say performance? Great. Okay. Yes. It's really exciting to me to kind of do some things, take some things I love to do in film to a new level on this project. So I've made a lot of films where I really develop like a long-term and kind of intimate relationship with the people I'm filming and then at a certain point of the process, once we know each other, once I have a real sense of the film, I say, hey, let's make some pretty pictures together. You know, like, how would you like to see yourself or what? I have this idea. Could we try this? And then we do a more controlled shoot, like a shoot where I'm not following their life, but we're going into a studio or we're going to a location and we're filming something that's actually more staged, but mm -hmm. there's some degree of collaboration where, I mean, sometimes I've said, this is my idea. Will you do it? And they say yes. And other times it comes from a 
back and forth conversation about mm. like an idea or fantasy and let's make it together. And in this project, even from the very beginning, I kind of wanted just as a part of my craft and practice, I wanted to take that further. Because I think the power, di- we're talking about power in medicine and this idea of like how both media and medicine represent people. There's a, there's a power dynamic in who gets to represent and what gets represented. And so I'm cognizant of that as a filmmaker and documentarian, I have that power too. And I want to share it. And I want to invite the people who I'm working with to not just consent to me being with them in a camera and watching parts of their life, which is really important in documentary, that observation, it is important to me in some of my, in a lot of my films, but also to actually craft something together that they are having more control and say in how they put themselves on screen. And I even do that in the personal parts of my film with myself, right? (laughs) Like I, I don't know, we can talk about the personal story part of it and how I've depicted myself later, but like in terms of the performance in Untitled Dwarfism Project, I mean, the story of making this film has been a story of discovering how loaded and problematic it is to live in a body that's always seen as a spectacle. Mm. It's always looked at and gawked at and where people are always trying to take illicit photos, like secret photos and videos and whether they're to laugh or gawk or even fetishize or whatever. Like there's this weird way that dwarf bodies get, they're not invisible. Like some bodies are, they're like hyper visible. They've Mm. been in media and fairy tales and stories and so I guess the story of making this doc is, is a story of like just really grappling with that and thinking about what does it mean to like ask to film little people community? And even if I'm part of it, make a decision to put this on screen. And one of the answers that felt really important, especially given the work I already have been doing as a filmmaker is to involve some of the people in putting themselves on screen, like intent, not just, can I film this? Yes. But more like, let's make something together. Right. And so what I'm doing as part of the core of the film and also a project that will be a little bit separate, um, that will live as, as its own little spinoff of the documentary is I'm working with a group of little people performers And I'm one main collaborator who's a really experienced actor and performer to come up with a series of like kind of prompts and topics that are all about what is dwarf culture now in this moment when our future is uncertain? Mm. And what is our history? How do we relate to it? Both our person, like what, what is each of our personal history, like in terms of among this group, but also what is our, what are we part of that's something bigger, a history of representations, a history of like being circus freaks and court dwarves and all kinds of other really interesting historical little moments and abilities and that come along with with dwarf history. So I'm asking, I am working with a group of little people performers to workshop those topics, come up with sort of performative like vignettes or little narrative moments that we shoot narrative style, like that we script. And I mean, you know, I'll take the lead and my collaborator, Sophia, also will be in the, you know, we'll, there's a structure to this so that we can get it done. But that said, the content and then the performance will be kind of through this participatory model of coming up with the content together and then filming it in a way that's much more akin, like the is akin to narrative filming, where we set the camera and block our actions and have lines and or movements or whatever. So, yeah. That's fascinating. And there are two things that I want to talk about. You said something about your role in this as a film that is somewhat personal. So I wanted to ask you about that. Is that something, do you normally feel that way about your work? And is it a departure for you to feel like this is also a personal story about you and your experience? 
it's totally a departure for me to make a personal film. I feel like all my films have been driven by my personal experience. I mean, maybe everyone's are, honestly. I mean, maybe mine are a little closer to the, you know, more visibly so, but you know, as someone who's fat, who's queer, you know, I've made films that have to do with my identity, but I think that I haven't made a film about, this is the first time I've made a film about myself that includes me, my parents, and kind of this journey of, you know, both discovering, discovering this diagnosis, but more importantly, like trying to figure out what that means. And also just like, trying to admit in a way that feels like <laughs> trying to be vulnerable, you know, mm-hmm. and talk about how it's hard to not belong and do it in a way that I feel comfortable with. And yet isn't so like, you know, even now as I'm talking about it, I'm like, okay, I can talk about it without feeling it. So, you know, trying to find ways and places to kind of do what I try to allow my film participants to do is like, feel comfortable, be vulnerable, allow me to be in difficult moments. And I need to, (laughs) one of the hardest things is allowing myself to be on camera in vulnerable moments. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is really hard for a lot of filmmakers, especially doc filmmakers. It's really easy to create you're speaking early about these really intimate relationships to build up trust for someone else to reveal themselves on camera, but we usually don't turn the camera around. Right. And I mean, honestly, I I don't know if it's like a kind of like defensiveness or something, but I always had a little bit, not, I love so many personal docs. Like there's some of my favorite films are, some of my favorite docs are personal docs. That said, there's also a lot of personal docs that I just get so irritated because I feel like they're, they're indulgent or like, I don't want to know about the filmmaker. I want to know about whatever else they're, they're telling us about. And they feel like they take up too much space. So the filmmaker takes up too much space. So I'm really scared. Like, I don't want to do that, you know, and I really have to walk a delicate line about including enough of myself to be real, to be honest and, you know, vulnerable, but also it's not, this film isn't, I really don't want it to be the Julie story with like little people in the background. That's my nightmare. Like I don't, Mm -hmm. that's not what I'm trying to do. And sometimes I'm like, do I have two separate, do I have three, do I have five separate projects here? I don't know. But I do think there's a way to weave the two things together. Like my story of connecting to community and then community, then a story about the portrait of community. Wow. I hear that so strongly. That's, that's a daunting line to consider (laughs) your process. I have total faith that you're going to be able to do this. Oh, thank you. Because you are making it. You're, you're expanding. I mean, a participatory doc can be just you sitting behind the camera asking questions, but you're using the word participatory in a different way in which like the subjects are also participating. So I think you will find your way, but it's definitely going to be a process. I know you can do it though. I know you can. Oh, Thank you. That means a lot. And, and honestly, it is like, it's a long process, right? Like I started this years ago. And, and so it sometimes feels it's easy to just be like, it's easy to lose confidence at different points. And um, it means a lot for you to say that, Pam, that you, you have confidence in me. Thank you. I do. I've seen your past work. I do have confidence in you. And I just hearing you speak about it and what your concerns are you'll definitely find that right balance. You said another thing, though, that I'm really curious about. Our future is uncertain. What do you mean when you say that? I mean that in the future, some or a lot of little people might look different than they do now. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. so much to filmmaker and performer Julie Wyman for being a guest on this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. The issues that Julie explores in her work feel deeply personal to me. 
I hope you'll listen to next week's episode when Julie and I continue our conversation. In the meantime, you can learn more about her at her website, IamJulieWyman.net. That's I-A-M-J-U-L-I-E-W-Y-M-A-N.net. You can also learn more about her films by looking her up on the Internet Movie Database by going to imdb.com and typing Julie Wyman into the search bar. The beautiful music used in the opening of this show is by Ketza. The music you've heard in this podcast is Yellow Light District and Otto Waschenlage Instrumental by Lobo Loco. Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 15 in D Major was performed by Karina Galanian. This episode was edited by Eva Herstova. Thank you for listening to this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. If you're enjoying this podcast, please let us know by giving us a five-star rating in Apple Podcasts or Good Pods. If you're feeling extra inspired, leaving a review letting us know what you're enjoying about the podcast is always very much appreciated. Thank you.